you. My name is Rinku Sen. I am co-president of the Women's March Board of Directors. I'm thrilled to be in conversation tonight with Valerie Carr about revolutionary love, the concept and how to practice it. As we get started, I invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat, maybe your name, your location, a word or two to describe how you're doing tonight. We are providing closed captioning for this webinar tonight. If you would like to access this feature, there is a button at the bottom of your screen. Click it and you should be good to go. We have over 2,000 people signed up for our chat tonight. Thank you so much for doing whatever you had to do to be with us. We know that these times are anything uh, other than normal and that there's a huge amount of fear and um, grief and struggle going on for all of us in, in so many of our lives. I want to introduce our special guest. Valerie Carr is a civil rights activist, lawyer, filmmaker, innovator, and founder of the Revolutionary Love Project. She's won national acclaim for her story-based advocacy, helping to win policy change on issues ranging from hate crimes to digital freedom. Her speeches have reached millions of people around the world and inspired a movement to reclaim love as a force for justice. She is a daughter of Sikh farmers in, Cal in California, and Valerie's earned degrees at Stanford University, Harvard Divinity School, and Yale Law School, and also holds an honorary directorate. She is a fellow at the Auburn Seminary, our wonderful co-sponsors um, of this event tonight. Uh, I want to just note that you can put your questions in the Q&A. That's also a little box at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to use the chat to communicate with each other and with us, but we'll only be looking for questions in the Q&A box. It's very likely that we won't be able to get to all of your questions, but we will do our best. For those of you on the phone, welcome. Uh, we know that you won't be able to see the visuals or see the chat, but we are so happy that you are here with us. In these difficult times of a mishandled pandemic, racial inequality, an unresponsive, if not abusive administration, and so many other issues, Women's March is committed to reclaiming love to drive our work. Today we're talking about revolutionary love, understanding that this is the practice of loving others, ourselves, and our opponents. I know that one's gonna be challenging for uh, me and many of us, but uh, we can do it. I think Valerie's gonna teach us how. The greatest nonviolent social movements in history were rooted in the ethics of love, not as a soft feeling, but as hard, demanding labor. Our guest, Valerie Carr, declares that this time of pain and crisis is also a chance for us to birth the America that we dream, where no person is disposable. She redefines love as labor, fierce, bloody, imperfect, and life-giving, engaging all of our emotions. Revolutionary love is the choice to labor for others, even our opponents, as well as ourselves. We will hear how progress in birthing labor is cyclical, not linear. As she points out in her work, the greatest social reformers in history did not only resist oppressors, they held up a vision of what the world ought to be. Our task is not just to unseat bad actors, but it's also to reimagine the institutions of power that ordered the world. Everyone has a role to play in birthing a new nation. Later on, Valerie will help us identify how black people, non-black people of color, and white allies have specific roles in the labor of revolutionary love. We are now going to start with Valerie's speech from the recent watch night service of the National Moral Revival Poor People's Campaign to ground our discussion. Let's watch that. Vaikuru ji ka kaansa, Vaikuru ji ki fateh. On Christmas Eve, 103 years ago, my grandfather waited in a dark and dank cell. 
He sailed by steamship across the Pacific Ocean from India to America, leaving behind colonial rule. But when he landed on American shores, immigration officials saw his dark skin, his tall turban worn as part of his sick faith, and saw him not as a brother, but as foreign, as suspect, threw him behind bars where he languished for months. Until a single man, a white man, a lawyer named Henry Marshall, filed a writ of habeas corpus that released him Christmas Eve, 1913. Mm. My grandfather, Kehar Singh, became a farmer, free to practice the heart of his sick faith, love and oneness. And so when his Japanese-American neighbors were rounded up and taken to their own detention camps in the deserts of America, he went out to see them when no one else would. He looked after their farms until they, reached, they returned home. He refused to stand down. That's right. In the aftermath of September 11th, when hate violence exploded in these United States and a man that I called uncle was murdered, I tried to stand up. I became a lawyer like the man who freed my grandfather and I joined a generation of activists fighting detentions and deportations, surveillance and special registration, hate crimes and racial profiling. And after 15 years, with every film, with every lawsuit, with every campaign, I thought we were making the nation safer for the next generation. Mama. And then my son was born. On Christmas Eve, I watched him ceremoniously put the milk and cookies by the fire for Santa Claus. And after he went to sleep, I then drank the milk and ate the cookies. <laughs> I wanted him to wake up and see them gone in the morning. I wanted him to believe in a world that was magical. But I am leaving my son a world that is more dangerous than the one that I was given. Because I am raising, we are raising a brown boy in America. A brown boy who may someday wear a turban as part of his faith. And in America today, as we enter an, an era of enormous rage, as white nationalists hail this moment as their great awakening, as hate acts against Sikhs and our Muslim brothers and sisters are at an all-time high, I know, I know that there will be moments, whether on the streets or in the schoolyard, where my son will be seen as foreign, as suspect, as a terrorist. Just as black bodies are still seen as criminal, brown bodies are still seen as illegal, Trans bodies are still seen as immoral. Indigenous bodies are still seen as savage. The bodies of women and girls seen as someone else's property. And when we see these bodies, not as brothers and sisters, then it becomes easier to bully them, to rape them, to allow policies that neglect them, that incarcerate them, that kill them. Yes, Rabbi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The future is dark. On this New Year's Eve, this watch night, I close my eyes and I see the darkness of my grandfather's cell. And I can feel the spirit of ever rising optimism in the Sikh tradition, Chardikala, within him. Mm. And so the mother in me asks, what if? What if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? Woo. What if our America... Yeah. 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 What if our America is not dead, but a country that is waiting to be born? What if the story of America is one long labor? What if all of our grandfathers and grandmothers are standing behind us now, those who survived occupation and genocide, slavery and Jim Crow, detentions and political assault? What if they're whispering in our ear today, tonight, you are brave? What if this is our nation's great transition? Mm.
is this the darkness of the tomb? Or the darkness of the womb? I asked that question almost four years ago, shortly after this president took power. And it is the question I have been asking myself every single day. In this moment, I believe that it is both. It is both. When 135,000 people have been killed by a virus whose scale and scope would have been prevented if we had competent leadership. When of those 135,000 people, they are disproportionately black people and brown people. Yes, it is the darkness of the tomb. When we see George Floyd losing his life before our eyes in a public lynching, when we know that we cannot bring him back, nor can we bring back Breonna Taylor or Nina Pop or Tony McDade or Rayshard Brooks, then it is the darkness of the tomb. When we are grieving together and we are raging together, against the scale of suffering and death. It feels as though death has won. I remember shortly after George Floyd's murder, my son, who is now five years old, we live in a neighborhood in Los Angeles where for about a week, our neighborhood became highly militarized. Helicopters overhead shaking the house, sirens of the night, popping noises, National Guard in the streets with their guns up. And we were already sheltering in place, but now we were really not leaving the house for fear, not of the virus, but for fear of the men with, with guns. And when we finally ventured out, I was so worried. I was so worried that I would have to explain to my son why there were men with guns standing in front of his preschool and in front of the cafes where I wrote so much of this book that has just come out. And I was trying to think about answers and I remember sitting in the back seat with my son as my, my husband was driving us and he was looking out and had this look of astonishment on his face. And I followed his eye line and I began to realize that he was looking at murals that had appeared overnight on the street, Abbott Kinney here in Venice, murals of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Tamir Rice and Black Lives Matter signs with hearts, hearts everywhere. <laughs> and my son looked at me and said, mommy, did you do this? Because <laughs> all he hears me talk about is revolutionary love and justice in our household. And I said, no, Gubby, we did this. We did this, what you hear your mommy talk about all the time. There are millions of people right now, rising up right now for love, in love, calling for justice in ways that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. So many of you, so many of you, so many white people and non-black people of color standing with our black sisters and brothers and siblings, calling for a national reckoning that has not left a single state in our nation untouched that is overturning every arena of our public life that is causing us to question how we might transition every single institution in our country. This reckoning, this revolutionary moment, I never thought I would see in a moment like this when I see so many of you risking your lives to march in the streets in the same way that we marched in the Women's March in 2017. Remember that first march? Here we are again rising up in numbers that in a moment like this, I am also seeing glimpses of the America that is longing to be born. I am seeing the darkness of the womb. And I know that what we are called to do is to remember the wisdom of the midwife, to breathe together, and to push together.
and to breathe again and to push again. So before I deliver my remarks to you all about the role of love in the fight for justice, I just want to invite us to breathe together for a few minutes. So if you would, you can find a cozy spot. Go ahead and place your feet on the ground. You can lower your eyes or close your eyes. And I invite you to take a deep breath together, let it come. Filling belly, chest, good, and let it go. Let it be the deepest breath you've taken today. Let it come. Good, and let it go. And now with this breath, let it come. And as you let it go, I invite you to become aware of the sensations that you might be feeling in your body. As you heard those words, as you heard my words now, I invite you to turn to your own body with a sense of curiosity, a sense of wonder of where you might be feeling the darkness of the tomb and the darkness of the womb. What are you experiencing? And you can just allow yourself to be aware of sensations, noticing the crown of your head, the space between your eyebrows, the saliva in your mouth, the dark secrecy of your throat, your chest, spaciousness around your heart, around your lungs. And as you take your attention to the back of your neck and your shoulders, I invite you to get even more curious about what emotions your body is holding. Taking your attention down the length of your spine, mid back and lower back, noticing the bowl of your pelvic floor taking your attention to your belly, your beautiful soft belly, placing your hand there, allowing yourself to notice even more what it is that you are carrying. Sweeping your attention down, down your legs, the right leg and then the left leg and noticing the ground beneath your feet, this earth beneath your feet. I invite you to notice now as you sense that earth beneath you, the 500 some people who are all on this call together, all of us are placing our feet on the same sweet earth. If you would, I invite you to imagine roots shooting down through the bottom of your feet. Imagine those roots, strong roots, grounding you into the earth, going vertically down, down further, and now growing horizontally. And your roots are seeking out my roots and Rinku's roots and the roots of all the others on the call. Can you imagine our roots intertwining? Can you imagine that? Good, we are like trees in a forest. We look as though we are standing apart, but truly we are interconnected, we are interdependent. And that means when we feel as though we are alone, we can receive each other's energy. You can take a deep breath, let it come. And as, a, as you let it come, invite that energy to come through your roots up, up into your body as if I am sending you the breath that you need. Let it come. Good, and let it go. Let it come. Let it go, letting that breath and energy wash all those parts of your body where you most need it. Let it go, let it come. Let it go. If you would now, I invite you to hold in your mind's eye a visual map of your body all the sensations that you noticed as you were breathing deeply with, with me, with each other. If you could give a name to that bundle of sensations, a name of an emotion, what emotions are you carrying in your body? And if you can raise your eyes just enough to type into the chat, to share with us what you are holding in your body so that we can become even more aware of what we are holding in our collective body. I invite you to do that. Good, and as soon as you write it, you can lower your eyes again. We are holding, you are holding, our bodies are holding anxiety and hope. 
fear and tenderness, vulnerability and grief. We witness you feeling the need to escape, feeling rage and exhaustion, feeling sadness, feeling grief, feeling concern and longing, longing for joy. We are feeling anger and yearning and uncertainty. We are feeling pressure and fire. We're feeling hope. We are feeling sad. We are feeling frustration. We are feeling patience. We are feeling confusion. We are feeling worry. We are feeling fear and we are feeling love. As you become aware of what you are feeling in your body and what our collective body is feeling, I invite you now to take one deep breath with me, one more of witness, let it come. Good, and let it go. And now I invite you to imagine an ancestor at your back. I had asked, what if all of our ancestors are standing behind us now? Could you imagine one ancestor that you wish to call forth? It could be an ancestor from your ancestral line or it could be an ancestor from history. Choose one person who makes you brave. Imagine that ancestor placing their hand on your back witnessing with you all that you are holding. This ancestor holds a piece of wisdom that you have been longing to hear, that you have been waiting to hear. Wisdom that you can only receive once you let the voices in the world and the voice in your mind get quiet enough to hear it. This ancestor has something to tell you I invite us to get quiet for a moment to hear what it is. I invite you to let it come to your lips what it is that you heard. Good. And I invite you to take your cupped hands to your lips and whisper it into your cupped hands. And if it was just no words, but a feeling, you can let a deep breath into your cupped hands. And once you've done that, you can imagine that as if you're holding something very precious, a precious piece of wisdom. And I invite you now to take that into your heart, let it come and let it go and let that wisdom just course through your body. Let it come and let it go and imagine that wisdom just coursing down, down into your roots. Imagine sending that wisdom to all of us. Imagine all of our circle of ancestors making us strong for this moment. And you are already doing it. If our bodies hold collective trauma, ancestral trauma, I believe that our bodies also hold ancestral wisdom and collective wisdom. And this is what our collective wisdom is saying right now. I am with you. You are strong. You are enough. Keep writing. It is time. Persist. You are wearing your courage well. You are purposeful. You are an instrument of change. Trust yourself. Keep going. Be resilient. Carry on. My grandfather who survived concentration camps, says Angelica, said, keep fighting, persevere, hold care, be brave. Beautiful. I invite you to keep sharing and to hold on to that collective wisdom and that feeling of ancestors at back and connection through the earth as we continue to reflect together.
after the watch night address that you all witnessed, I gave that address back in 2016, New Year's Eve. I remember um, it started to go viral on inauguration day. And the day after inauguration, I appeared with my son to march in the Women's March. And I looked up in, in my grief and in my trauma, I looked up and I began to see those words on protest signs. So many of you had painted those words. What if this is not the darkness of the tomb, but of the womb? And it was a sense of awe and a sense of connection. And the question that was keeping me alive was not keeping so many of us alive. It became a sort of mantra of the movement. And I was overwhelmed by thousands of you who wrote me and said, but I'm ready to breathe and push, but how do we breathe? How do we breathe? How do we push? How do we keep laboring for justice when the labor feels endless? And at the time, I had was feeling so breathless that I realized that I needed to answer these questions for myself as much as for anyone else. And so I was given a gift that very few women who are mothers or activists are ever given. After being on the front lines of fighting for justice for my community and other communities since 9-11, I was given time off in a room of my own. And I chose to move my family to a corner of the rainforest in Central America for a year. And I remember the rainforest felt like a womb. It was warm and wet and generative. And I was able to finally take the deepest breath I had taken and call upon my ancestors. And I sat with all the stories of my life and I sat with all the stories of social movements before us and I sat with all the stories of ancestral wisdom in the Sikh tradition and in our other great wisdom traditions and I was looking for patterns and I began to see patterns emerge, patterns that I now call practices of revolutionary love. You see, I believe that the way that we labor for justice, the way that we birth a new nation that is truly anti-racist, the way that we birth the world that we are longing for, is if we stay in the fire through practicing the ethic of love in our lives and in our movements. I believe revolutionary love is the call of our times. Now, I am trained as a lawyer. And that means I have always been trained to roll my eyes when people stand up and say love is the answer. All I could hear was thoughts and prayers and good feelings and kumbaya. And I said, this is no way to address systemic injustice. Love has been used as a bludgeon, as a disguise. But remember, I called ancestors to my back, right? And the ancestor I had called to my back, the ancestor I feel behind me now was my grandfather my turbaned sick grandfather who would give me the stories of my sick faith. And he gave me the story of Guru Nanak, the first teacher in the sick faith. Guru Nanak, can I share with you the story that I heard as a little girl? This is how the story goes. And I'm reading from, um, I'm reading from this book, See No Stranger. Five centuries ago, halfway around the world in a village in Punjab on the Indian subcontinent, there lived a young man named Nanak. He was deeply troubled by the violence around him, Hindus and Muslims in turmoil. One day he disappeared on the bank of a river for three days. People thought he was dead, drowned. But Nanak emerged on the third day with a vision of Ik Omgad, the oneness of humanity and the oneness of the world. And this vision threw him into a state of wonder, the smad. He began singing songs of devotion. In other words, he was in love. And love made him see with new eyes. He could look upon the face of anyone around him and say, you are a part of me I do not yet know. You are a part of me I do not yet know. Na ko beri, nei begana. Na ko beri, nei begana. I see no enemy. I see no stranger said Guru Nanak. Guru Nanak taught that all of us could see the world in this way, that separateness is an illusion, that when we quiet the chatter in our heads through music or meditation or recitation or song or through breathing together, then the boundaries begin to disappear. The bowl breaks. 
For a moment, we taste the truth sweet as nectar. We belong to one another. Joy rushes in. Long after the moment passes, we can choose to remember the truth. We can choose to see no stranger. Love, Papaji used to tell me, love is dangerous business. <laughs> For if I see you as a part of me, I do not yet know. If I choose to see you as my sister, as my brother, as my sibling, if I choose to see you, then I must be willing to let your grief into my heart. I must be willing to hear your story. And I must be willing to fight for you in the face of injustice. And so the ideal in the Sikh faith was the Sant Sapai, the warrior sage or the sage warrior. The warrior fights. The sage loves. I came to understand it as a path of revolutionary love. Revolutionary love. Social reformers through history, spiritual teachers of all kind, they did not talk about love as a feeling, as a rush of emotion. They talked about love as a fierce and disciplined practice, as an ethic. And I believe that Caregiver, caregivers of all kinds, and so many of us women who have done the work of caregiving that we know this. The first moment when my son was placed on my chest after he was born and I was shaking and sobbing from the rush of feeling, I was falling in love and I said, oh, this is what it is to fall in love, and it is. But love is so much more than that. I looked at my mother next to me and she was opening up her bag and taking out her dal and chol and proceeding to feed me like feeding her baby while I was feeding mine. <laughs> my mother, my mother had never stopped laboring for me from my birth to my son's birth to my daughter's birth. She knew what I was just waking up to, that love is a more than a rush of feeling. Love is sweet labor. It is fierce and bloody and imperfect and life-giving that love is a choice that we have to make over and over and over again. And if love is labor, then love contains all of the emotions. We know this, right? Joy is the gift of love. Grief is the price of love. Rage, our anger, is the force that protects that which is loved. So many of you right now, are reclaiming love as a force for justice for a new time. I see you grieving with others who do not look like you, raging with others, rising with others, fighting with others, breathing and pushing with others. And my question is how, how do we stay in the labor? especially those of you who are newly inaugurated activists, who are marching for the first time with the Women's March, who are marching for the first time with signs that say Black Lives Matter. When you go back into your schools and your homes and your houses of worship and your workplaces, there's no institution on the face of this planet that does not need you right now to transition it. That this is not just the work of a few months, that this is generational work. And so how do you stay in that long labor? What, is, what have our ancestors taught us about how to practice love. That is my offering as a, a sick woman, as a woman of color, as an activist. Um, I lay out a framework for revolutionary love and you can find the framework here in this book, See No Stranger, but the framework involves 10 core practices of revolutionary love, wondering, grieving, fighting, raging, listening, reimagining, breathing, pushing, transitioning, and letting enjoy. Because if love is labor, then love can be taught, love can be modeled, and love can be practiced. And so there are three practices that I believe are vital in this moment. And so I wanna give you these three practices as a way to invite you to imagine how you might be able to live into them even more in your life and in your justice work. The first practice I wanna share is around grieving. We have often been taught as activists to think about spaces for grieving as secondary work. But grieving together is frontline social justice work. For those we grieve with determine who we organize with and who we fight for. 
I'm reading from the chapter called Grieve. America does not know how to grieve black lives because doing so would mean accepting that there was never complete abolition. Slavery transmuted into segregation, which morphed into discriminatory laws and now into policies that appear neutral on their face, but still disparately violate people of color. New horrors keep arising from old impulses. The past keeps bleeding into the present. No civilization in the world is exempt. But what is particular to America is that many who suffered enormous loss and destruction have had to do so alone, had to marshal language to tell the story, only to find that there was no one to hear it because their suffering contradicts the story that the nation keeps telling itself, the story of American exceptionalism. A nation that cannot see its own past, cannot see the suffering it has caused, suffering that persists into the present, a nation that cannot see our suffering, cannot grieve with us. A nation that cannot grieve with us, cannot know us, and therefore cannot love us. But this brings me to you. There have always been people who did what the nation as a whole did not. They crossed the line and took the hand of someone who did not look like them and wept with them as if to say, you are grieving, but you do not grieve alone. America's greatest social movements were rooted in the solidarity that came from shared grieving. First people grieve together, then they organize together. There are always those who rush to bury the dead, who cut down the lynching noose or attended the memorials to say, not in my name. When people who have no obvious reason to love each other come together to grieve, they can give birth to new relationships, even revolutions. So many of you have been brave with your grief, have chosen to see George Floyd not as a criminal or as a stranger, but as a brother. And this is hard work, this is emotional work to take George Floyd as brother, Breonna Taylor as sister, Rayshard Brooks as brother, Nina, Nina Pop as sister. That is to let unspeakable grief into our hearts for so many Black people who have had to bear this grief alone year after year, decade after decade, we cannot know what that grief is like, but we can sit with them in the darkness and take their hand and say, you are grieving, but you do not grieve alone, not anymore. We are here to breathe with you and to push with you. And that is what is so extraordinary about this moment. For many, this moment has felt like 1968. It has felt like 1992, but we are now seeing an army of white people standing in front of black people kneeling in the street in front of a blockade of police officers with batons. We have never seen images like that before. Never before. So many white people, so many non-black people of color grieving with black people to say black lives matter. And the fact of the matter is grieving will continue to be part of our labor as the death toll rises from this pandemic and from state violence. And so how can you, what do you need to be brave with your grief? How can you create spaces in your families, in your communities, in your movements virtually to hold one another in grief? For in our grieving relationships deepen, solidarity doesn't just become about the logic of exchange. It becomes we show up for each other in solidarity because we love one another. And that brings me to the second practice, which is rage. What does it mean not to just to grieve together, but to rage together? As a woman of color, I feel like I was always taught to suppress my rage in the name of love and forgiveness. I bought the lie that the opposite of love was rage. But the opposite of love is not rage, it is indifference. When we think about love as labor, rage is essential and necessary. Oxytocin is called the love hormone. The more oxytocin in the body, the more care and nurturing mammals show for their babies. Oxytocin decreases aggression in a mother's body overall with one exception, in defense of her young. 
You see, when babies are threatened, oxytocin actually increases aggression. Rage is part of love. It is the biological force that protects that which is loved. I did not know this until I found the courage finally to, like many women, break my silence around a sexual assault in my childhood. And it was my mother, my mother who stood before me with fire in her eyes, saying no to the family members who wanted to keep me quiet. They, she said, no, not my daughter, not anymore. I had never seen that kind of rage roaring inside of her, but she was teaching me that our rage helps us tap into our impulse to fight and our power, our ability to fight for ourselves as beloved and as worthwhile and as worth fighting for. Black women have long taught us about the importance of protecting our rage. You see, we live in a culture that punishes us when we show our teeth. We are called hysterical. When we raise our voice, we are less likely to be believed when we tell our story with fury. And if we are anything less than deferential with an officer, we might get hurt or shot, or even then, it, our deference might not make a difference. Black and brown people have been schooled in the suppression of our emotions as a matter of survival. This is what Bell Hooks said. We learned when we were very little that black people could die from feeling rage and expressing it to the wrong white folks. We learned to choke down our rage. We know now, we have the data to show us that repressing anger comes at an extreme cost to our health. Our health. It results in high rates of autoimmune diseases. It's what eats us up from the inside. And that's why so many black and brown women die early, get sick, or take their own life. Repressing our rage is dangerous. But letting it explode is also dangerous. So many men and boys are conditioned to let their rage explode as a sign of their own machismo or their own worth. And so the solution is not to suppress our rage or to let it explode, but to process our rage in safe containers. Safe containers, shaking, weeping, venting, writing, art, ceremonies of all kinds. Only when we give rage an expression external to ourselves can we be in relationship with it. We can then ask, what information does my rage carry? What is it telling me? How do I wish to harness this energy? You see, when we release our rage in safe containers, then we have the ability to decide how we want to harness it as a creative force in our lives. And I call that divine rage. Imagine the fury in Jesus' eyes when he overturned the tables of the money changers in the Christian temple, or the fury of Kali, the fiercest form of the goddess Durga in Hindu tradition. It is only through accessing our ferocity that divine rage can take form. You see, the purpose of divine rage is not vengeance, but to reorder the world. The purpose of divine rage is not vengeance, but to reorder the world. So yes, there is a role for rage in our movements for justice. And there is a role for white people who wish to become not just allies, but follow the, the, the instruction of our indigenous leaders who tell us that we need more than allies, we need accomplices. We need accomplices, accomplices who conspire with us to break these chains of oppression, just as we need accomplices to hold protected spaces where the most traumatized among us tend to our grief. So too do we need accomplices to stand by us when we express our rage and help others to understand it. So I ask you, what is your particular role in this moment in honoring your rage? and creating safe containers for raw rage and helping us access our divine rage and helping the country hear our rage in our fight to reorder the world. And that reordering brings me to the third practice I wish to share. So we talked about grieving, we talked about raging, and the final practice I wanna share is reimagining do you remember after this president took power, it was all about resistance? We have to resist the president, resist the onslaught of policies, resist the hate. We called ourselves the resistance. We even had t-shirts that said the resistance. And I wanna be clear, I believe re resistance is powerful and necessary for our survival. But when it becomes the dominant frame and the only frame, then resistance will never 
give us the ability to create a new reality. It will always trap us in an adversarial power struggle. And so I am so invigorated by this moment that we are in because we as a movement have already moved. We are moving from resistance to reimagining institutions of power. And we have our ancestors to look to for how to do this. The greatest social reformers in history did not only resist oppressors, they held up a vision of what the world ought to be. Think about it. Nanak sang it. Muhammad led it. Jesus taught it. Buddha envisioned it. King dreamt it. Dorothy Day labored for it. Mandela lived it. Gandhi died for it. Grace Lee Boggs fought for it for seven decades. May we all be like her, everybody. They called for us not only to unseat bad actors, but to reimagine the institutions of power that ordered the world. Any social harm can be traced to institutions that produce it, authorize it, or otherwise profit from it. To undo the injustice, we have to imagine new institutions and step in to lead them. We are re we are reimagining policing in this country. We are reimagining public safety in this country. We are reimagining criminal justice in this country. But I invite you to think not only about those big grand institutions, imagine the small institutions in every arena of the life that you live. Think about your workplace and your school and your house of worship. There is no institution in this moment that does not need you to transition it, to re imagine it. And so my third practice invites us to protect spaces for reimagining. I am deeply invested in unseating this president in November. I am more invested in changing the conditions of power that brought him into office in the first place. And those conditions will not change the day after the election, no matter who gets elected. If this is generational work, then how will you stay in the labor? What is your role in transitioning yourself and the institutions that you have access to? Love is only revolutionary when it has no limit. And so this is where we think about what it means to practice loving even our opponents. And I wanna be clear. If you have a knee on your neck right now in the way that so many black people and brown people do at this moment, it is not your job, it is not our job to look up into the face of our oppressor and try to wonder about them or try to love them. No, our job is to stay alive. Our job is to take the next breath. Our job is to survive. Our job is to protect our families and our loved ones. That is our revolutionary act to protect ourselves, to love ourselves well. But if you have a measure of priv privilege by virtue of the color of your skin or whatever resources you hold, if you are safe enough to wonder about those people who are participating in institutions of power that perpetuate our oppression, then maybe it is your job to do that brave and revolutionary act of listening to them, of seeing them, of tending to their wound. I know this is a dangerous thing to say, and I think it's never been a popular thing to say. It's never been popular to call for love without limit. But in my experience, and I, I talk about these stories, whenever I have sat down with white supremacists or prison guards, or soldiers, or my former abusers. I always want to hate them. I always want to see them as monsters, but there are no such thing as monsters in this world. There are only human beings who are wounded, who hurt us out of their own sense of suffering, or insecurity, or anxiety, or blindness, or greed. And their participation in our oppression comes at a cost. It cuts them off from their own capacity to love. It may not be my job to tend their wound, but it may be yours. 
And if we think about the labor of birthing a new nation, the labor of revolutionary love, every one of us has a specific role. I think about all of the white people now who are ready not just to become allies, but accomplices. What if you are the generation that gives whiteness a new meaning? Whiteness has been synonymous with domination or blindness. What if you gave whiteness the meaning of deep solidarity and a deep accompliceship, accompliceship? What if you could tend to the wounds of a disaffected white people in your families and your neighborhoods and your communities in a way that I couldn't because they wouldn't talk to me or it's not safe enough for me to do that labor? We need you. We need every single one of us because I wanna be able to hold up a vision of a nation that includes even my opponents. The goal of this labor is not just to win. We don't fight to win. We labor to create a new reality. And these are the stakes. And I'll leave you with this and then I can't wait to talk to Rinku. Within 25 years, the number of people of color in this country will exceed the number of white people for the first time since colonization. And we are at a crossroads. Will we continue to descend into a kind of civil war? No matter who's elected this November, will it be a power struggle with those who want to return America to a past where only a certain class of white people hold economic, cultural, and political power? Or, Will enough of us, will a critical mass of us find the bravery, summon our wisdom to show up to the labor, to breathe and to push, to labor for a nation that has never been in the course of history, a nation that is truly multi-racial, multi-faith, multi-cultural, where power is shared, and we strive to protect the dignity and the wellness of every single one of us. With climate change upon us, time is running out. And so it is up to each of us to stay in that labor, stay in that long labor. And I have found, I believe that my ancestors have shown us that the way that we stay in the labor is through anchoring our lives and our movements and the practices of love, love for others, love for our opponents, and love for ourselves. For we will be someone else's ancestors one day. We will be someone else's ancestors one day. And if we get this right, they will inherit not just our fear or our trauma, they will inherit our bravery and our wisdom. Thank you, Valerie, so much. I just from my own feelings and from reading the chat, I can see how big an effect these ideas are having on um, all of the people who have joined us today. And I am so super grateful for the huge, um, amazing representation from all over the country. I just want to note that we have people on the line from North Carolina, Iowa, Michigan, Florida, New York, California, Texas, where I am. Um, so glad to see a uh, sister and fellow Texans here, Maryland, Illinois, Massachusetts, Kentucky, and DC, which by the way, should be a state. So um, just really, really thrilled to see the Women's March community turn out to hear you um, and the wisdom that you've collected and thought through over, over uh, the course of your life, I think it sounds like. Um, just one um, reflection that I have is that, you know, in the romanticized version of love, love is cast as a state of being, like I am in love. Um, and it's, it's, it's like a feeling in a way that you are um, seeing yourself and, and relating to yourself. Um, but really, I think what you're suggesting is that it's actually a practice. It's not a state of being that's unchanging, you know, where you're in love and then you're not in love. It's a constant practice. And my own reflection about that practice in my life is that it, it, 
it feels like a kind of discipline. Um, it's like, which requires some routine, the repetition of doing it all the time in lots of different kinds of situations. And um, not just with your opponents, but with everybody. It, it's hard to practice love when I'm angry with somebody like Donald Trump, but it's also hard to practice it when I'm under stress, when I have too many things to do, when I haven't slept well, when I'm hungry. I mean, there's a reason that the word hangry has become part of our, uh, part of our lexicon. And discipline for me means um, that, um, so you do, you talk about love not being a soft kind of love, this practice being hard work. But for me, the discipline comes in actually accessing my softness and, and um, being able to be soft with myself and with the people around me. So, um, and discipline means that sometimes I can't do just whatever the, whatever, what the thing is that I most feel like doing. The thing I most feel like doing might be knocking somebody upside the head so because I'm just so mad at them or walking out the room because I can't, you know, deal with the uh, emotions anymore. But staying in is a discipline, um, being soft is a discipline. Um, so anyway, the, that, that's like the first, m m deepest reaction I think I've had to, to listening to your talk tonight. I so appreciate that, Rinku. And I, I just want to say, I am just so honored to be in conversation with you. You have been a sister who has blazed paths so that the activists coming behind you could walk them. You've been in this labor for a very long time. And I keep thinking that we don't give birth alone. We don't go into battle alone. Like we need each other. We need each other. And to, to watch you lead with love, you embody it in all of your justice work, your organizing work, your writing and your speaking and your teaching. And so I am inspired by you and emboldened by you. I thank you. I agree with you that um, love is not a state of being, an unchanging state of being, that it is a labor. I have come to experience in my own body, in my own life, that once I started to think about my life as a series of experiments with love, the personal, the political, all tangled up with each other, how can I keep practicing love, showing up with love? How can I, then, it, it becomes less of a belief that you were holding. I feel like so many people are wanting to be anti-racist right now and leaning in and holding it on really hard and keeping it in your mind. <laughs> but it's like, no, no, it's not just a belief. It is, um, it has to be integrated into your emotional body. It is an orientation to life. It is a way of moving through the world. It's a way of being. And when we are practicing love as a discipline, accessing our softness, even as we are doing that difficult work of showing up again and again, then I think it invites us. We live into a, a new way of being in the world. Yeah, I think the um, role of the body that you raise is so important. I remember once I was, uh, I had the honor of interviewing Patrice Cullors, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. And Patrice is a dancer and a performer. And, you know, we were having a discussion about leadership and, and how you lead, how you lead in organizations that are very diverse and big and, um, uh, full of really passionate people and I remember asking her you know what does the body have to do with all of this because and and she talked about how she felt at the very first um, action that she went to where the community was challenging a uh, I think it was city council member or the mayor or something and um, how nervous she felt about that and how um, how she had to work the courage up inside of her body. And then once she had done it, how her body felt different, how her body felt um, emboldened, as you said, and looser the next time that she had to do it. So I definitely think part of this practice is like great self-awareness of what is going in your, on in your body. My, my, um, my teachers of physical things, uh, one of them, says the body never lies the body will not lie to you your mind your mind might 
lie to you, your intellect, your eyes might even lie to you. We don't always see everything that is actually in front of us, but the body will never ever lie. And I think, um, you know, women's march, we march because we understand that you got to put your body into it in order for the, um, the love to take hold and in order for the next action that you're gonna take to be easier. So um, this isn't an intellectual exercise, it's extremely physical and it does require that you eat and rest and drink water and hydrate. I have a very big hot pink water bottle for a reason. <laughs> Like I cannot not see it. I have to be drinking. Um, you know, you know, Rinku. I I think what you're naming right now is the feminist intervention. Is the feminist intervention into how we are reclaiming love in this generation? I feel like in previous generations, love has been this sort of abstract ethic, and it's been this um, defined as these external practices out there. But what we are doing with so many black and brown activists are doing, so many women are doing right now is embodying what it looks like to think about grieving as an act of revolutionary love, raging as an act of revolutionary love, breathing together like we did. We, we, we became aware of what our bodies are holding because our bodies never lie. Breathing together as an act of loving ourselves that, that, that I think that what we are offering is a way to um, embody practices of revolutionary love so that the next generation has an even more full and multi-dimensional understanding of what it means to really walk a life dedicated to love as an ethic. Yeah, you know, the, the, your um, lifting up of the importance of grieving and of collectively grieving really, really makes me think about how little collective grieving we've done as a country um, during this pandemic. And, um, you know, in some ways I feel like the protests were that collective grief. We didn't get in the streets for our PPE or for ventilators, but um, I think, but many, many of us were grieving. By the time the protests started in early June, we had lost, I think at that point we were at 100,000 um, people already who had died of COVID um, in this country. So that is hundreds of thousands of families, not just 100,000 people, but probably another seven attached to each of those people who had died. And we didn't, some of us didn't even get to grieve properly in the moment in our family situations, but we certainly didn't get to grieve collectively, and I do think that the protests were about um, uh, grief for the many people we've lost to police violence, mm -hmm. but fueled in some ways by the grief of this pandemic, the grief caused by this pandemic. And, um, you know, one, one last thought I have before we go to the questions and try to get a few of those in, is that you know at Women's March and as organizers and activists, we're always thinking about what is going to motivate people to act because we need action. We need um, prayers, we need speaking, we need um, bodies in the streets, we need checks sent, uh, you know, we need so many actions. So as an organizer, I was always taught that there were two ways of, of generating, generating action. Uh, and as a communicator was taught this as well. So anger is one way, outrage is one way. Um, sorrow, I was taught, is, is not activating. You know, when people are sad, they, they uh, you know, wanna lie in their beds and pull the covers over their heads. Um, but I think you're suggesting that sorrow can be activating um, as an aspect of love. And I think one other aspect of love is remorse. Um, that's also activating. I know many people who took an action because they were sorry about the action they didn't take 10 years ago or the harm that they actually did or participated in um, knowingly or unknowingly. So I think that re remorse and repentance, which we see so little of in our um, political national leadership these days, 
is a, is also a motiv motivating factor that is grounded in love. And it's the story of remorse driving people to action is not one that we tell often enough mm. um, and, and could encourage a lot more of. Mm. I agree. Um, so, Omaima, are you going to read us questions or should we just sort through them ourselves? No, we have, uh, well, first, thank you so much, Valerie, for sharing your really inspiring words. Um, so many of our wonderful participants in the chat were saying they could listen to you all day. And I definitely love <laughs> that sentiment. Um, we have some really wonderful questions that participants have given. I'm so sad we can't get to them all. Um, but a few definitely stand out. One person asks, how do you balance demanding accountability for wrongdoing along with forgiveness and love? That's a great question. Do you wanna, do you wanna start on that, Valerie? I can answer in the form of my own experience with this. I became an activist, not by choice. In the aftermath of the horror of 9-11, the first person killed in a hate crime after the terrorist attacks was a sick father, Babir Singh Sodi. I, I called him uncle. He was a family friend and his murder turned me into an activist. And I worked with his family. I still, for so many years, almost 20 years now in telling his story and fighting the onslaught of policies that were fueling the hate violence that continued to target Sikh and Muslim Americans. And I remember it was a 15 year anniversary of Bobir uncle's murder and murder. And I was standing at the gas station where he was killed and putting flowers on the spot where he bled to death. And I was standing next to his brother and his brother turned to me and said, nothing has changed. And I could see fatigue in his brother's eyes, Rana. And I asked, who is the one person we have not yet tried to love? Frank Roque was Bob your uncle's murderer and he was spending a life sentence in prison. The Sodi family did not push for the death penalty, did not want the death penalty because they believed it foreclosed the possibility of transformation. But this was a man who said, yes, I'm gonna go and kill the towel heads and their children too. I mean, what kind of transformation is possible for a man like that? And yet, perhaps just out of a sense of desperation, we called him the next morning. The phone is ringing, my heart is beating in my chest, and he answers, and wonder is the wellspring of love, wonder. I felt nothing for him as my opponent, no empathy, no compassion, but I held on to the conscious act, the will to wonder about him to refuse to see him as a monster, to try to understand. And so I asked him the question, why? And he said, well, I'm sorry for what happened to your uncle, but I'm sorry for also the thousands of people who were killed on 9-11. He refuses to take responsibility. I start to feel my rage, my righteous rage. And that was my role because the more rage I felt, I was acting as a guardian to Rana and giving Rana space to continue wondering about Frank listening to him and Rana says, Frank, this is the first time I've heard you say you were sorry. And Frank says, yes, I am sorry for what I did to your brother. And when I go to heaven to be judged by God, I will ask to see your brother and I will hug him and I will ask for his forgiveness. And Rana says, We've already forgiven you. I have come to learn that forgiveness is not forgetting. It's not the absence of accountability for harm. Forgiveness is freedom from hate. It's for you, not them, it's for you. But I want to tell you, especially those of you who are thinking of people that you cannot forgive, that it took us 15 years to get to that point. It took us 15 years of grieving and raging and people loving us well, loving ourselves well, for us to even want to wonder about our opponent, for us to even want to be able to forgive him. And somebody 
this is where we all have different roles in the labor. It wasn't our job to tend to the wound in Frank Roque and this white supremacist. There was somebody in the prison who was able to see his wound, to tend to his wound, to help him figure out how to reckon with his shame and his guilt and his remorse to get to the point where he could actually ask for an apology, ask for forgiveness and apologize. But I could never imagine that we would reconcile with Frank Roque. And there are some people, perhaps people like this president that I may never reconcile with, that we may never reconcile with in the course of our lives. But if some of us continue to wonder and tend to the wounds of people who, then it creates previously unimaginable possibilities. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, the abolitionists, the prison abolitionists um, among us have really challenged all of our thinking about how you have loving accountability. And the only thing I will add to this response is that, um, you know, just as a everyday matter for me, the punishment has to fit the crime. So we can't be, um, we, we have to have some judiciousness um, and hopefully approaching the whole project from a place of love helps us have that. And there are certain punishments that are just morally wrong that, that should never be on the table and um, are inconsistent with um, love and accountability and are really just revenge and um, revenge and misuse of power, abuse of power, you know, a punishment that we can meet out um, that we meet out just because we can as a society. Um, earlier this week, the federal government executed uh, someone for the first time in 17 years. For 17 years, the death penalty has been off the table in um, federal uh, prosecutions. And, um, and now it's back on because we just murdered someone. Um, uh, someone that I would have found challenging to love, but nevertheless, that is murder and just wrong. So some, some forms of accountability just can't be our forms. We can't adopt them because they're, they're inconsistent. All right, let's see, maybe we can do one more uh, question. Omaima says we don't have to end at exactly uh, 9.15 Eastern. So let's see if we can get one or two more questions in here. Oh, Mama, you have another one for us? I do. This one is an excellent one. Um, what is a personal practice that we can do daily that is rooted in revolutionary love? I got one, but I don't know if you have one, Rinku. I'll just start with my, uh, mine quickly. I find that I really have to take a walk every day or I, and it's hot here in Texas. We're in the like 102 degree days now, um, but I still have to go outside and walk every day. And um, lately a practice I've had is I've been trying to save a gardenia bush in my front yard that my very good um, friend bought for me and planted. And when I, when I water it, there's a toad who comes out of the hole, out of a, a hole that I think the toad dug um, in my flower bed. And so I've started to just like water it a little harder. And I've noticed that if I just pour the water directly down into the hole, um, the toad comes up, they come up and they're clearly thirsty. And so daily I've been connecting with my toad friend just to um, just to connect with a, another being who is all beings. Um, the last thing is I, I um, my friend Shoyinka Rahim, who has been on this chat, um, her philosophy is breathe in, breathe out love, be, be love. And so I get daily <laughs> reminders that it's, it's love is all the time available. Uh, we take it in, we send it out um, through nothing more than our breath. <laughs> On election night when this president took power and grief was seizing my throat and the horror was coming over me, my son tugged on my sleeve and said, dance time, mommy. 
I said, dance time on a night like this. And we do dance time as part of our evening ritual. And I was just like, no. And my husband was like, your rules. <laughs> and so we turned down CNN and we turned up the music and it was, baby, you're a firework. And at first I was just like, like this. I was so not, not having it. And my son suddenly like jumps in my arms. Boom, boom, boom. Even brighter than the moon, moon, moon. And he starts squealing and he says, throw me up, mommy. And I throw him up and he's laughing and I'm laughing and he's dancing and I'm dancing. I was dancing. Rinko, I was dancing on election night. <laughs> And afterwards, I felt this surge of rising energy, like flood my body. And I thought, I can do this. That joy, joy, I believe joy is our greatest act of moral resistance. That joy returns us to everything that is good and beautiful and worth fighting for. And so practicing, protecting space and time to cultivate joy, we still do dance time every night, even even during this dark and cruel and treacherous time, we still dance in our house every single night. And so how are you protecting your joy every day? How are you letting that energy give you the strength to keep showing up to the labor? That's my practice. Great. Okay, Omaima, I think we can do one more and then um, we will wrap up so, so, so sadly, <laughs> um, but joyously, of course. <laughs> Great. Um, Valerie, um, a participant asks, what do we do when our emotions are actually overwhelming? So where does love fit in when we're fatigued, either by hate or even by empathy? When you feel overwhelmed, that is always to be a sign to love yourself. So if revolutionary love, if that framework is about loving others and opponents and ourselves, overwhelm is just unprocessed emotion to be able to access and move through our grief and our rage and our pain and our trauma and our fatigue is how we then find the energy to show up to the labor once more. I have found that hope, that hope is a feeling that waxes and wanes like the moon waxes and wanes. And sometimes it's really bright and it's really full and it's, you feel that possibility and you believe that a new world is possible. And sometimes it is so faint, it's like the sliver of a crescent moon. And those nights when I am so overwhelmed, it feels so faint that I can't even see it. Maybe it's a new moon. What matters, I believe, is not the waxing and the waning. Let the, let the feelings come and go, come and go. What matters is the ability to show up to the labor anyway with these hands, to do what you can. Is it your role in this moment to love yourself well? Is it your role to love others? Is it your role to reach out to opponents and to trust that your success is not measured by outcomes? Your success is measured by your faithfulness to the labor. I'll give you just one last example. The last thing I did before this pandemic was work uh, as a lawyer in an asylum clinic in Tijuana. And I sat with mothers who looked just like me, holding children who looked just like mine, fleeing unspeakable horrors. And I was so angry that these women were being tortured by a country that they were fleeing and our government who would not let them cross the border to find safety while they were applying for asylum under the Remain in Mexico program. I vowed that I wanted to do something for them. And then the pandemic hit and I was overwhelmed. And I had to focus on protecting my own children and my own body and my own health and my parents. And finally, I found enough safety and stability to wonder, it always begins with wonder, to wonder again about those mothers and those women. And I mustered the courage to reach out to them. And they, they are in great need, even greater than before. It is, it is a nightmare. But there is one thing that we can do. There's always one thing that our hands can do, no matter how hopeless we feel. There's one thing. And today, today there's one thing that you all can do. The, the US government, our administration has proposed a new asylum rule that will effectively end any chance of asylum for the mothers I had met. The comment period ends at midnight tonight. And so if you go to my social feeds, you can see an opportunity just to take one minute to submit a comment to say, no, not in our name. We choose to see no stranger. We choose to see those mothers as our own mothers, those children as our own children. We choose to show up 
with love another day. And it's just now and next, now and next. Can you keep showing up to do what love calls you to do now and next? Awesome. Thank you so much. I just, um, since you raised Grace Lee Boggs's um, presence earlier, I just want to say that my favorite quote of hers is the one where she says, you must love the questions like you love the people. And um, and you got to love the people's questions too. You can't be like, I love the people, but I don't love their questions. Um, because our questions for each other are so often challenging. And um and sometimes difficult to answer you know sometimes things we don't want to dig deeply into so um i'm 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 committed to moving forward loving the people and loving loving all of our questions as much as i love the people Valerie, I want to thank you so, so much. I am going to wrap us up uh, with a couple of quick announcements about um, what you can do with Women's March in the coming period. Um, as you can see, we are committed to a revolutionary love practice because hate violence and state violence run together, as Valerie reminds us. Um, but we know that um, in history, we have lots and lots of examples of deep and sustained solidarity being the key to racial and gender and economic and all sorts of um, additional progress. Um, the idea of Revolutionary Loves connects to all of the work that Women's March is doing. I encourage you to check out our feminist organizing school, as well as the work we're doing on intersectionality and building a movement that is centered on the leadership of Black people, indi uh, indi Indigenous people, I'm so sorry, and uh, people of color as a whole, and that includes everyone contribution. Um, we are in the process right now of transforming institutions of power. Uh, while we're fighting to defund the police, um, you can learn about that work at defund the police webinars and organizing meetings. Um, it can feel impossible to lead with love, but we know that responding with love is revolutionary and radical just in and of itself. So uh, remember your grief, remember your rage, and remember to protect the spaces of reimagination uh, and imagination. Uh, we invite all of you to join us in our work ongoing. This month, we'll be launching the Feminist Organizing School. We'll also be launching our, uh, or uh, you can also get involved in our Women to Women election work. I saw discussion of uh, election watch ideas in the chat. I think that would be a great thing. We will be sending a recording of this webinar in a follow-up email to you later this week. I want to say thanks again so much to our co-sponsors at the Auburn Sem Seminary. Women's March and Auburn Seminary, we are like this, and we are so, so, so grateful to have you in our universe, to be in your universe. And thank you again so much to Valerie for sharing your wisdom and for modeling leadership that's rooted in a deep, deep understanding of love. We believe you when you say that we can do it. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ringu. <laughs>
monster, just more learned behavior. Under his thick skin is something so tender. See no stranger, no typecast, no token. See all people as people in motion. There are no monsters, there are no strangers. That's just a shedding of armor. You can't come for forgiveness, it's such tricky business. And he hears your story, and I. 